If you followed the news in any way lately, you, you've seen quite a few things uh, take place as we read headlines. And just this past week, we did have a presidential debate. Um, but you don't have to look far beyond that just to see the political climate and the difficulty and the things that exist there. But then beyond the political climate is the, uh, the world itself and just the sin that seems to pervade throughout our country, throughout the world, but also sin that is pervade and it even carries forth throughout even the church. The church is made up as the body of Christ, but it is made up of individual members of that body who, though uh, redeemed, though restored, though called out, set apart, made new, we're not immune from sinfulness. We're not immune for the difficulty of sin, the temptation to sin, the falling into sin in some way. That's why throughout New Testament teaching, you see over and over again encouragement for the church and members of it to be confessing their sin to one another, to be praying for one another. There's a continual process for God's people of confession, repentance, and restoration from sin in our lives. Just in the last handful of weeks, we see from headlines two very prominent leaders that are very close to our area of the world admitted, confessed some form of past sin. And because of that sin, it was sin to such a level that they would resign their position as pastor over their church. And these are two very large churches. It's Robert Morris at Gateway and it's Tony Evans at Oak Cliff Fellowship. These churches are massive churches. These churches could be considered the mega church with thousands and thousands of members. Their influence is far reaching, but you see at the top of that leadership of these people are two men who we may look at and think that they are up there because they're there. They're in a place where they've, they've arrived or they've conquered, conquered sin in such a way that they may not fall, and that's not the case. But for each of these two men... It was past sin, and an attempt to, was made to cover that sin, to keep it concealed in such a way that their ministry would continue. But here, all sin will out in some way. The Lord will bring all things to light. What's in darkness will be, at some point in time, brought into the light. Under heaven now, or at one time in the future, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, it will be outed. But in this case, you see in the headlines, you see in the church, and specifically in church leadership, you see two men with great influence and leadership not immune to sin and falling into it. One of which admitted openly to his sin. And that sin was sexual in nature. And I'm not going to go into all the detail of it. I... You can read the headlines, you can read the articles and find out for yourself. But what happens is sin existed at a point in time it was not dealt with in the way that it was meant to be dealt with and over time it outed and the influence and ministry of an individual is vastly affected and it trickles down and in this case to thousands and thousands of people are affected by one man's sin. Now, we're not all in such a position, but we should all be walking our lives out and leading our lives in such a way that we have that level of influence. It should prompt our heart to open this confession of sin, but get on the front side of that sin to begin with. And this is what Jesus is doing in our text as we've talked about the law, he says, I've come to fulfill the law. He says to the religious leaders and the people, you've got the law wrong. I'm going to show you what the meaning, I'm going to bring clarity to what the law meant in a few things. And the subject this morning is that of sexual sin. As Jesus addresses sexual sin, adultery, he addresses lust. But then he also gives in an appropriate response to such sin. So this text this morning and this teaching is difficult in many ways, but it's absolutely necessary in many others. 
as the proclivity to sexual sin has pervaded mankind since the beginning. When I think of Sodom and Gomorrah, an entire city was reduced to absolute rubble. Its existence on earth is even questionable. They cannot find now. Archaeology cannot positively determine where Sodom and Gomorrah existed because God destroyed it utterly from the earth. But the sin at issue in such a city was one of sexual sin. Some of the most heinous stories that you read in God's word come about because of sexual sin. Now, Jesus addresses specifically adultery here. That's the main context with which he teaches. But the underlying issue is one of lust and desire and where that ultimately comes from. So this message is difficult. It's going to be difficult to give, but it's also difficult to take in as we think about these things. But it's sobering because the world around us is broken, but the church is struggling with this thing as well. But it's needed because we can't, we can't afford church to continue to bury our head in the sand amidst such issues that pervade themselves throughout our culture when it comes to sexuality and all of the sin that follows. But you see throughout God's word, many men struggle with this thing. Abraham, Samson, David, Solomon, many others struggled with sexual sin. If you read the letters to the Corinthian church, you see that this church struggled deeply with sexual sin. And as rampant as it is in our culture, it's rampant in the American church, but not just the American church. It is rampant in the church at large because no one is immune from sin and where it comes from. So with all that said, if we feel the tension and the weight of this particular thing, Matthew chapter 5, Verse 27 through 30. Let's just read the whole text together as we have each week. And then we'll talk through what Jesus is teaching here. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He says, so if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off. Or your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you be with us this morning. Lord, as we read and we take in your word and what you have to say on a difficult topic, a topic that in some ways we've been trained to hide and not discuss. But Jesus so openly discussed and made his point on this topic. And be with us this morning as we look to understand more of what you have to say on it. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Jesus starts here as he did before with, um, you have heard that it was said, and he addresses a specific commandment. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now why does he pick this particular one? It is a sin that carries forth large consequence, but he speaks specifically specifically of adultery. But at that day and time, this is the seventh commandment, Exodus 20, 14, Deuteronomy 5, 18. This, this is a commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And it seems as if that should be clear, right? That's an easy one, kind of like you shall not murder. It's understood, we shouldn't take a life. That just seems wrong. But when it comes to adultery, likewise, it, just, it should seem wrong to us to commit adultery, if you've entered into a union with an individual between a man and a woman, they make vows to one another. They promise to love one another through all of the difficulties, the rises, the highs, the lows, the diff- all of it. They vow to love one another. And that love would be lasting until the day that they part. What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. 
So it seems clear. It's an easy one. We shouldn't commit adultery against this person that we've made vows to that we say under heaven we love more than anyone else on this planet. That should be an easy one. But yet it's part of the Ten Commandments. When God gave the law in the very beginning, the first ten things he tells his people not to do, this is among them. Why? Because it is a thing that we are prone to do. Again, you see these in these men in Scripture. You see them, this with the nation of Israel itself and their adultery against their God in heaven. But for the rabbis in Jesus' day, they tended to look at adultery as wrong because it involved simply stealing a brother or another person's wife. The issue for them was, was external. It was one of just simply thievery. That's someone else's wife as if she is someone else's possession and some other man has come along and stolen her. That's the way the rabbis would look at adultery. And Jesus says this isn't, that's that surface level. Thievery is not the issue here when it comes to adultery. There's something else at root in that. It's not a matter of possession and I want your wife just to have her. The implication is, is there something else there that drives an individual to see someone else's wife and desire her in some way? It's not a car to be stolen. It's not money in a bank to be taken. It's a person. And there's something about that person that brings about in a desire in an individual to go and take that person and commit this act. So it's not an external thing that is done as Jesus has done before you have heard that it was said you shall not do this thing in this case adultery he says but I say to you and when he says but I say to you he's elevating himself as the authority remember Jesus just said I have come to fulfill the law therefore what I say that seems to your ears to be contrary to what the law would say. He says, I say this based on the authority that's been given to me. I don't speak on my own authority, Jesus says elsewhere. What I speak, I speak from the Father. And I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He points out, it's not, the phys- it's not the external act that happens. They're not just thievery and thieving away someone's wife. He gets to the heart of the matter. Anyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. And he begins to lay out where sin, in this case, happens. It doesn't happen. Sin never ends. It ends in the act, but it begins elsewhere. So he sees adultery here is wrong because it made the lustful individual impure spiritually, not physically. So where does sin in this case begin? Becomes the question. If we think through this and what Jesus is getting at and how we can respond to it, the first thing with any sin that will best help you and I with whatever it is, come to that temptation and be able to walk away from it. When I think of 1 Corinthians 10, whenever Jesus says, where where Paul says that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But God is faithful and he provides a way of escape so that you can endure it. The more we understand the nature of sin, the more we see the way of escape. So let's look here at what Jesus says. If we look at where sin here begins, it begins with the eye. As Jesus says, he says, I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully. The first thing that happens is a look. In the Greek, it's blepo. It means simply to see. But it carries the idea of seeing both with the bodily eye or the mind's eye. However, it's used in context both ways. But as we look at this idea here, we can see both come about. And we'll address both here in just a minute. But it's simply to see. He says, for someone who looks at a woman lustfully. But the verb form here is the present participle. It means that it should be understood that it's a continuous thing that's being done. It's looking. It's not simply for our language to say, oh, I just looked at that. It carries the idea of, no, you are looking at that. There is a continual process, a continuation of the looking So Jesus is not speaking of a glance. He's not speaking of the unintentional noticing of something. 
You and I can't control everything that we see as we come and go in this world. We have eyes that are meant to be used, they're meant to be open, they're meant to be up. We can't walk as we should and not stumble over things with, with our eyes open. We see things so that we can come and move about, but we can't control everything at a glance or everything in our peripheral, everything that comes in front of us. You cannot control every image that is in front of you. No more than you can control every single thought that comes across your mind or your mind's eye. So Jesus' point isn't that, is one that just looks at something because you can't control every woman that walks by you or in front of you or what she's wearing. So what is Jesus getting at? The idea is there is a looking with intention. Jesus says that anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, it's as if the mind is made up there's the glance, there's the pass by, there's the notice, and then there's the second look. And man, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands as how many second looks you take. Women, I'm not going to ask you by a show of hands how many second looks you take. This teaching is for both men and women. But the mind is made up, and the reason for the mind making up, being made up, the reason for the looking is lust, is what Jesus says. As we look and we see and we notice something different and it captivates our mind in such a way that we decide to continue on in that look or turn our head back and grab hold of that image. And then once we grab hold of that image, we grab hold of a thought. And then sin being what it is compounds on top of that thought. And it brings birth desire. And when birth desire is full grown, it gives then birth to sin. But it begins in this case, church, with our eye what we see and what we look at. But he says, anyone who looks with now lustful intent, the word there is epithumeo in the Greek. It's a compound of two words, but it means to set the heart upon or desire or covet. And it's a compound of the name or the noun thumos, which is our passion. In ancient Greek understanding of this word thumos, it's the psychological center it's, it's the heart. It's also the lungs. But it carries the idea of passion, harshness, fierceness is how this word would be understood in Greek teaching. But the thumos was the inner being. It's that passion that boils up within us. It was used synonymously with anger or rage or wrath. And when you think about those emotions, we all understand those emotions clearly. Anger and rage and wrath. And the boiling up of that, the heat that comes up within it, just to die back down, that at another time it boils back up. But show of hands, you ever had boiling anger? Come on. You've been at a point in your life where you've probably thrown a temper tantrum. If you didn't do it as an adult, you did it as a child at some point. But we all understand that feeling, the boiling up that goes within us and it rises to a level to where it pops and it blows out. That is thumos, but it comes from our center. Also carries the idea of breathing and panting, panting heavily, sometimes violently. It's just you're so angry from the inside of you, you're, you've lost your breath, your blood pressure is up, and you're panting over this emotion. And here now coupled with the preposition epi, now it becomes epi through mayo. Epi is, is a pawn. So this emotion, this boiling up now is then applied to a subject. And in this case, that boiling up of desire and covetousness and passion is directed in this case at a woman. That is the emotion, the drive and the pull to that. That's what's happening within you and I, whenever we look at something lustfully. In this case, it's, it's sexual in nature to what Jesus is getting at. But when I think of the lust of the eyes, it's anything that we may desire that we don't have. And we can look at that thing in such a way where we desire that thing in such a way and it boils within us where this is not satiated until I give into it and allow it to boil over and take that thing that I desire. And then that desire is fulfilled and it begins to swell back down. Now apply that to sexual sin 
and the heinousness of it. I think of Judges chapter 19. How does that happen from men? If you know the story, I'm not going to go into it, but you can read Judges 19, 20, and 21. How does that happen within men if it's not from a place where this passion and desire has boiled over? That's what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah when the angels came into Lot's house and the men of the city pressed against that door desiring to take and have their way with these men. It was this boiling passion within them. This is the idea that Jesus is getting at. The adultery that happens is not because a man stole another's wife. The adultery happens in the heart when a man or woman sees a person that they desire and boils with them in is this lustful yearning and desire for that person. That's where the sin issue happens. The act, it ends with an act. So Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. It is purposeful looking. It's the sin of adultery. It begins there in the heart. John MacArthur, he says this regarding it. He says, it is not lustful looking that causes the sin in the heart, but the sin in the heart that causes lustful looking. The lustful looking is but the expression of a heart that is already immoral and adulterous. The heart is the soil where the seeds of sin are embedded and begin to grow. The seed comes from somewhere else. It is embedded in our heart and that's where it begins to grow. And it grows as we water it. In this case, that second, third, fourth look and intently looking and staying on that is where we begin to water that seed that has been implanted. So practical takeaway right there. What do we do in this case when we have the temptation for that second glance is get rid of your water hose. Don't water it. Don't settle on that thought. Don't settle on that image. Don't settle on that person. You take that thought captive. You turn that over to Christ. You begin to pray for help and intercession. Get behind me, Satan. Flee from the devil and, or resist the devil and he will flee from you. All of these things are present for you in these places of temptation. But I want to answer this question real quick. Where does the seed come from? Again, it comes from our eye. Seeds are scattered around us throughout our lives all of the time when it comes to our eye. Later on in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says these words. He says, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He puts it to a question. If you're allowing things into your eye that doesn't need to be in your eye and it's bringing about an unhealthy state in you, how great is that unhealthy state? Take an account of the darkness that you're allowing into what should be light. Remember, he says we are the light of the world. How much of this darkness are we allowing to come in and be implanted as seeds in our heart? D.A. Carson says this. We got this for you. He says, imagination is a God-given gift. But if, it is fed by, but if it is fed dirt by the eye, it will be dirty. All sin, not the least sexual sin, begins with the imagination. Therefore, what feeds the imagination is of maximum importance in the pursuit of kingdom righteousness. Leave that up there for just a second. I'm going to read that last line again. Therefore, what feeds the imagination is of maximum importance in the pursuit of kingdom righteousness. Righteousness. If the eye is the lamp into the body, if the eye is the seed, what the seed comes through the eye and it is into the body and it's allowed to take root and then it's watered and it grows from there into sin, then it is of maximum importance what we are allowing to enter into our eyes. So the biggest avenue for specifically sexual sin and lustful temptation is your eye, is my eye. But we live in a technological age. There's a day and time in history where there was no TV, there was no phone, there was no screen. It was just simply the world in which we saw. 
It took a physical woman present in the presence of a man for him to see her and then allow that image and that thought to enter into his mind and then sin to, sin to follow from that. But it took the physical presence and then the imagination after seeing it, yes. But in our day and age, we have screens and things in front of us all the time, 24-7. There are images that are pervade and placed in front of us in commercials and ads. Sex is used to get you to buy something all of the time. It is an industry that has grown, that makes millions and millions of dollars because this industry understands all we have to do is get it in front of people and let them see it, and then they will take it. The world and the enemy understand that better than you and I do, sadly. And we've not only succumbed to it, church, mankind has created it. When I think of Romans chapter 1, when Paul says they invent new ways of doing sin, this is it. The technological increase that we've come to in our understanding of it and our ability to create things that are useful, but we are simply creating more ways to be more sinful. And the enemy takes that ability and he runs with it knowing our weakness and our proclivity to sin. It's on this fact that specifically the porn industry has built its empire. I have some stats just specifically on pornography here that I think it bears great importance to mention. In our day and age and the ability with which we have been a device on our phone in the dark secluded areas of our life that no one else can be and see us with that device, we can sit there behind closed doors and we can see the wickedness that this world has to offer when it comes to sexual sin. And the porn industry knows it. It generates more income than the combined revenues of ABC, NBC, and CBS, and more than the combined revenues of the NFL, NBA, and MLB. In the USA alone, the porn industry generates between 15 and $97 billion a year. Every second, $3,075.64 is being spent on pornography. Think for a moment what $3,000 buys you. Every second that's spent, someone is watching pornography, paying to watch it somewhere on a device. Almost 6 in 10 young adults ages 18 to 24, that's 57%, seek out porn either daily, weekly, or monthly. 64% of self-identified Christian men and 15% of self-identified Christian women view pornography at least once a month compared to, here's this, compared to 65% of non-Christian men and 30% of non-Christian women. Did you catch that? 64% of self-identified Christian men Watch pornography at least once a month while 65% of non-Christian men, it's virtually the same. There's no difference between the professing, professing Christian man and the non-Christian man and their viewing of pornography at least once a week. Women, it's by half. When asked their feelings about porn use, a majority of adults, it's 54%, say that it doesn't really bother them at all. 51% of teen and young adult women Pornography users have sent a nude image via text, email, or app. When polled, teens and young adults believe that excessive use of electricity and water, as well as not recycling, is worse than pornographic content and explicit material. You see the lessening, the lessening of sin in this particular realm. It's become a joke. It's a byword. It's just a thing that we do. One in seven senior pastors, pastors use porn on a regular basis. That's more than 50,000 U.S. church leaders. Dr. Jeffrey Satinovery says the underlying nature of an addiction to pornography chemically is nearly identical to a heroin addiction. Now there are articles on top of articles on this subject. 
Covenant Eyes has some fantastic literature on pornography and chemically what's happening in your brain when you're addicted to it. But it is akin to a heroin addiction. If you don't know the nature of heroin and the addiction that exists there, that is the boiling over of thumos. It is that level of desire from our center that covets, lusts after, and it boils and rises over and over and over. And with no ability to fulfill that or press that back down, it's let out over and over and over and over again. And it absolutely ruins lives. Sin kills everything. When God told Adam and Eve, you do this, you're going to die. Adam and Eve fell into sin. Did they immediately die? No. The first thing that did die was something to provide skin to properly cover them because their covering was insufficient. But death will always be the penalty to sin. Here, now, Instantly, sometimes. Other times, it continues on. But relationships die. Careers die. Friendships die. Many different things other than just life itself dies on the altar of our lustful thoughts and intentions. Here's an example. It's probably one of the most famous examples circumstances of sexual sin and failure and the cost and consequence of it. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 through 5, it says, In the spring of the, of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. And you begin to see a problem already for this king, if you know the story. At a time when kings went out to battle. This story, this account is written after this has happened, naturally. But there's an understanding. It was at a time when kings go out to battle, but yet where is David? He remained at Jerusalem. He's already not doing what he should be doing. He remained instead of going to battle. But then verse 2, it says, it happened late one afternoon. It says, it happened the writer is writing this account and says, it happened. He doesn't at this point have to describe what happened. He's about to tell what happened. But he says, it specifically happened. As if the understanding, the people that are going to immediately read this account and this story in the time of its writing knew. The scandal was public. The scandal was made known. It happened. How often can we think of something? When I think of a Robert Morris at Gateway Church, or years going to be to come where people within that church think and look back to the situation and say, man, I remember when it happened. Such is the idea in the mind of the people at the time. But it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that what? He saw. He saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, is, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and she lay with her, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This is a story that has been retold the individual subjects of it have been changed for thousands of years. This story didn't begin with King David, but it's included in God's word to highlight no one is immune from such a desire and such an act. It has been pervaded over and over and over throughout history. Just change the names and some of the specifics. But here you have a king that was supposed to be at battle. He finds himself remaining at home. Then he finds himself up on the roof of his house. There's nothing wrong with walking on the roof of his house at all. Nothing wrong with walking on the roof. And you have a view of the city before you. 
Nothing wrong with that. Probably walking out in the evening. It feels good outside. Let's just see the landscape. But in that, his eye catches a woman bathing. And in that moment, he has a decision to see that and to turn his gaze, go back inside or to sit in it and look intently. And it seems as if he looks intently at it. And then he goes further. That desire is placed now. The seed is placed in his heart. It begins to give birth. And he inquires about who that is. And he finds out who she is specifically. She's Uriah, the Hittite's wife. Well, Uriah's off to battle. Let's bring her in. And then not only that, double sin here, how that passion boils up. It says there specifically, now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. It's written in the law that a woman following her period and her cycle would go through a period of cleansing from her unpurification. Bathsheba is within that time period. And he's still, instead of waiting for her cleanness to come about, he still enters into that act. There was no foregoing, there was no putting off, there was no waiting, the desire is present and he has the ability and he's going to go forth with it. And he does. What follows from this is she's pregnant, becomes found out what he tries to do to hide this fact that she's pregnant. He sends to the army and requires that Uriah come to, back to Jerusalem he brings Uriah in, sets at table with him. Hey, how are things going, Uriah? Hey, how are you doing? Hey, man, it's glad. Hey, why don't you go home? Why don't you, why don't you go home, spend the night with your wife? You've been away at battle. Hey, just go home. Spend, spend the night with your wife. In David's mind, in his deception, he's going to send his husband home to sleep with his wife because he's been away at battle. That's what, he's been away from his wife. He's going to go home, sleep and lay with his wife, and therefore the baby that comes about is his. It's not mine. But Uriah, being a righteous man, says no. He sleeps outside the palace. He doesn't go home. He says, the men that I serve and fight with, they're at battle. I'm not going to go to my bed or my brothers are fighting. I mean, such is a conviction against the king right there. So David goes further, he brings him in again, and he, he, he gets him drunk. He thinks, hey, if I get him drunk, in his drunkenness, he's going to go home and do this, and he still doesn't. So David fails again. So what did David decide to do? He decides now to send Uriah back to the front line. He sends with him a letter to be given to Joab, the commander of the army. And in this letter, the very letter that Uriah likely took, handed to his commander, was a letter that said to Joab, put Uriah on the front line where the fighting is the worst and the most fierce, knowing that Uriah is going to go to that line and he's going to die where the fighting is that fierce. This is where you have King David now being labeled not just an adulterer, but a murderer. And he thinks that he's covered up his sin. Takes Bathsheba to be his wife. All is good. And it was Nathan the prophet that brings this about to light to him. And the word of the Lord says that because of what you've done, there's going to be turmoil and enmity between your offspring, between your children for generations to come. But before that happens, the child that you've conceived is going to die. The consequence for our sin is always going to be death. The text tells us that David mourned. He put on sackcloth and ashes and he mourned and interceded and he prayed and pled and begged the Lord to spare the life of his child. But the child died. David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. His mind was idle. He lusted first. He acted second. His, this led to lies, more sin, hiding, spiritual hardness of heart, and the consequences of that would impact future generations because of this one act in this man with that level of influence. No one is immune. 
but we read the text. I mean, through, from there, David's practice of continuing to add wives showed a lack of sexual restraint. He didn't learn from this. He continued to take on wives so that he could give himself over to those feelings and those desires. His son Solomon did the same thing with 700 wives and 500 concubines. But this shows us that if one woman isn't enough, 1,000 will not be enough to satiate the desire that is within us on this particular sin. So we see what links David went to hide his sin. But now here's the deal and we'll begin to wrap up. Jesus shows us a contrasting view of the links to which we should go as he illustrates the links to which we should go when it comes to this level of sin. In verse 29, he says now, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than, the whole, than that your whole body go into hell. Now Jesus isn't saying that we should literally gouge out our eye if we do a second look or cut off our hand. But what Jesus is highlighting is the seriousness with which sin is and the cost of such sin. We should take it so seriously that if our eye causes us to sin, we should be willing to gouge it out to remove the temptation entirely. But it's not practical. He's not saying, hey, mutilate your body to keep you from sinning. No, but the point is, at that point in time, mankind had an inability to do that. Such is the seriousness and the level to which mankind would have to go to get away from looking intently and lusting after something because you can't control it the way that you should. So the best thing for you to do is just gouge your eyes out to remove the ability to see to begin with. But what that still leaves is the thought and imagination that you already have that the enemy will still bring to your remembrance and plant that in your heart. And the imagination as the imagination is, we do not need an image physically in front of us to remember such things. And that is also the challenge for this particular sin. But I say this often when I counsel men and I talk through this particular thing is that you cannot, women as well here, not that I've counseled women in this thing, but for you as well, you cannot control the things that you see or the thoughts that enter your mind any more than you can control a bird flying over your head. Birds exist and they fly in the air above us. We have eyes, things exist in the world and they come and go across our eyes. Thoughts exist in our mind and they come and go. We cannot control that bird flying over our head, but the thing that you can control is whether or not it nests on your head. But how foolish would it be to allow a bird to nest physically on your head. We wouldn't. What ultimately will happen? What's coming out of that nest? This is the way that I lighten the illustration. But you'll end up with crap on your face if you let a bird nest on your head. If we give ourselves over to sin and we allow that thought to enter in and we take it captive and we press it down and allow it to grow in our heart, consequences will follow one way or another. Ephesians 4, and 24, Apostle Paul says this. He says, To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, Created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. God takes sin seriously. God takes sin so seriously that he sent his only son to take on the entirety of the world's sin. Past, present, future. That he would send his own son to go to the cross to take on that. The worst thing that Jesus endured that day on the cross was not the beating of men. It was the sinfulness of this world placed upon him. You ever thought why Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he experienced sin for the first time. 
He felt it. It grieved him so deeply that he felt disconnected from his father for the first time in his time on earth as a human. He felt disconnected from God because of sin. In his humanity, he didn't know how to respond other than cry out to God. How do we view sin in our lives? How does Cody King view sin in his life? Do I have enough to where I fall to my knees and I cry out to God? Why have you forsaken me? But then I'm reminded that Jesus did it for me. The very person just giving this message that he's telling them, hey, this is what this level of sin is. This is what it does. This is the one that's going to the cross to take it for you, for me, so that I don't have to cry out to God in such a way. I get to cry out to God and say, be merciful for me, to me, a sinner. And in his grace, he says, rise up. Look to my son. But that's God saying, that's what I think of sin. That's what I did about it. But if you don't come to him, it's on you. No one is immune, but the glory of this with King David, it's purposeful to go to that story. We all know it. We've all heard if you've grown up in church. David, the greatest king, failed, but that's the point. This is a man after God's own heart, but yet he failed in one of the worst of ways. This is mankind would define sin. He was it. That was bad. Same consequence as the light of sin. But what we see there is a man after God's own heart that there's always grace and there will be restoration for those who turn their eyes to Jesus. There is nothing that you and I will ever do, sexual sin, sexual morality, murdering, any of these other things that Jesus is going to get to in this sermon that we will do that will remove us from God's grace if we will but humble ourselves, confess our sin to a holy God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, 1 John 1, 9. But what's required is a confession before God. And cleansing follows. That is the putting off of the old and putting on the new in true righteousness and holiness. God demands it. So he sent his son to give it to us. But what you and I have to do is go to him. And when our eyes see something and we have the temptation for that double take in whatever manner it may be, what the graciousness of our Father in heaven has done for us is give us his spirit and his son so that we can take captive that thought and say, no, I'm not going to look back. Father, will you help me? I promise in your heart, if you do that, there will be no seed that falls on any fertile ground for sin to grow. And you'll find yourself moving forward. The more often you and I do that in any sin, the more often we walk away from temptation, whatever it may be. But if we're not practicing that thing, we will fall. We're either practicing to fall or we're practicing to to walk steadily with feet firmly set on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Paul said it as plainly as day. Galatians 5, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Church, may we learn to walk by the Spirit. That is the graciousness of God. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for this morning and Lord, such a, a difficult thing to even to teach, to talk through, to think through. Because it is, it is it's a sin, Lord, that, that the enemy has done so well to keep hidden. But the reason why we do it in the dark, the reason why we do it where no one sees and we don't tell anybody, we don't confess, is because we understand there's a shame that comes with it. If it's no big deal, why aren't we talking about it at parties? We don't do that. 
because we inherently understand the depravity in which this particular sin is and the level with which it is. And those that do do it in public, those that do proclaim it and brag about it in a bodacious way, Lord, those are those that are far from you. And those are those, Lord, that need to see a great light. And if God's people hide in dark places and do what some do out in the open, Lord, how will those that do it in the open ever find conviction to change? May you help us, Lord, to not render ourselves ineffective in ministry. Would you help us to guard our hearts with all vigilance, Lord? To guard our eyes and what we see to keep sin from our heart. Lord, we need your help. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.